So good morning, one and all, and welcome to the second series of webinars on population health. My name is George Anibaba, and I work for Health Innovation Kent Surrey Sussex, and it is our very incredible, incredibly humble privilege to be working together with Sussex ICS uh, Integrated Care System, for those of you who don't like acronyms, uh, and NHS Sussex, and in particular the population health team on what is the second year of the Population Health Academy after what feels like a successful first series where we try to provide a foundation for all our collective uh, learning on population health. Today, we are extremely delighted to be kicking off a second series building on that learning by focusing on topics based on insights captured from the last series and current evolving needs. However, before we get started, some virtual housekeeping. So a screen um, is going to pop up shortly with some virtual housekeeping. So I was tempted to say something about a fire drill, but we're not expecting one because we're all in our individual respective locations. So if there is a fire drill, I'm afraid that's something you'll have to sort out where you are. And you've probably heard me um, run that line before. <laughs> but in all seriousness, um, setting up your screen as per um, the instructions in the invitation. This webinar has been recorded. Uh, attendees, if you could kindly um, switch off your cameras and remain on mute, because uh, we want to reserve that for the speakers. Uh, and of course, to enjoy and have the optimal virtual experience, you can click on view um, and select speaker to make sure that you're spotlighting on the speaker. We're also going to have some polls and quizzes but don't be alarmed, they're not exams. We're not trying to test or judge anyone, uh, but really, genuinely, they're just polls and quizzes for us to uh, gauge a few things and to interact. So you'll be asked to take part in various polls and quizzes via Slido. Now, in terms of the Slido details, uh, please type the link you see on your screen in your internet browser or your phone or whatever device you're using and add the event code 152410 and you'll see the Slido link in the chat as well. And uh, we will also share and select polls and we'll share that in the chat as we just have every time uh, we need to do a poll or a quiz. In terms of uh, Q&A, if you have any questions or comments, please use a chat function to submit your, your question at any time. Uh, we won't be using the raise hand function uh, given the volume of people we're expecting. And in terms of timings, presenters will, will try to answer as many questions as possible during the session. but. Of course, if we run out of time, these will be answered and shared in uh, follow on communications. For those of you who are social media savvy or enthusiasts, uh, follow us along on Twitter or X or whatever you choose to call it and share your insights uh, using the hashtag Sussex Pop Health. Um, if we can have the next slide, please. Now, some of you will be familiar with um, those words at the top and those symbols. So. Um, and probably some of you probably have, have um, been involved in developing these, who knows, but these are the NHS constitution values. And whilst they're NHS focused and NHS linked, I'd like to think that they resonate with everybody across our geography, everybody across the country, and hopefully globally as well, because they are um, associated with core human values, I believe. And our topic today, as you know, is cultural competence in healthcare, and it's about bridging the divide, which is quite an important theme and topic and discussion. And currently, we find ourselves in a moment where the headlines, whether it's the unrest in our streets, reflections of Black History Month this month, or narratives of division, all these things remind us just how urgent and necessary conversation like this, conversations like these are, especially as it pertains to a, a core and fundamental human right, namely access to decent healthcare. So as we gather today, our focus is not on what divides us, but on what can unite us. Healthcare is one of the most powerful spaces where our differences intersect, where, where trust is built or broken, where cultural understanding can be the difference between life and death, 
uh, literally. And in this webinar, we'll explore how we as people working across Sussex or even beyond in our respective capacities as professionals or members of the public can better serve the vulnerable, the overlooked and the underserved by integrating what sounds like a buzzword, cultural competence into our practice. So really it's about ensuring every patient, every person we serve directly or indirectly is not only heard but understood. So we have a challenge today. It's to move beyond token gestures and towards um, more genuine inclusive engagement. And together we'll look at practical ways and strategies for reaching populations that need us the most uh, by incorporating cultural competence into our daily practice. And we know this is a journey, it won't happen overnight. So hopefully we can begin to rebuild trust and truly bridge the divide. And to that end, we have hopefully what I believe is a, a an exciting lineup and agenda. So next slide, please. Thank you. So um, we're going to have a few people who are going to lend their respective perspectives. Uh, that's a bit of alliteration there <laughs> to help us all achieve our intended outcome today of essentially learning about and eventually putting into practice approaches, strategies for engaging our diverse populations in an inclusive way. And without further ado, you've heard enough from me for now. I'm going to pass the mic on to um, Kerry Dudley from NHS Sussex, who's going to set the scene a bit for us in terms of the geography, the geographical landscape, but also the importance of the academy. Kerry, over to you. Thank you, George. Good morning, everybody. My name is Kerry Dudley and I'm head of the Population and Health Inequalities in NHS Sussex. As you can see from the slide attached, there are currently avoidable and inequitable differences in, in health for different groups of people in Sussex. The Sussex system came together and committed to addressing health equalities for some of our most underserved and underrepresented communities through our shared strategy, Improving Lives Together. The Population Health Academy is central to addressing the key challenges and delivering our strategy commitments. As we recently heard from Lord Darcy, we need to change how we currently work and shift things, for example, from analogue systems to digital from hospital-based care to community-centred services, and moving from focusing on just sickness to actively embracing prevention upstream. These changes aren't just operational, but reflect a commitment to building a more equitable, sustainable and resilient healthcare system for the future and for our population in Sussex. As George said earlier, we've completed our first year academy and fellowship. And together we saw our first cohort of equity fellows successfully complete a full program of learning. And they had, have had the opportunity to share their experiences and projects at both local and national level. We continue to develop our website and delivering learning events such, today, as, such as today. And as George said, we've really put the foundation in, in that first year. And this is helping us um, to make the population health and achieving greater equity for our population, everyone's business, and that we think about it at every stage of our commissioning cycles. The Academy's focus on population health equips us to address health on a broader scale. It goes beyond just treating individuals to improving the health of whole communities by tackling the social determinants of health. Factors like housing, education and environment. If we can fix those and help people with those, it can deeply influence their health outcomes. With the pressures we're currently facing in our health and care system, this comprehensive data-driven approach is critical to ensuring equitable care and supporting the diverse needs of every community in Sussex. So why are we taking this time right now to consider cultural competences? As Sussex continues to grow more diverse, the need for cultural competence in healthcare has never been more urgent. Providing care that is sensitive and responsive to cultural needs of our population is fund fundamental to delivering that equitable care. Without having that deep understanding of these needs, we risk continually perpetuating inequalities and failing to build that trust that's crucial for effective healthcare interventions, especially within our communities. The Academy and Equity Fellows are well placed to link with some of our excellent, brilliant networks, for example, Inclusion Health Network, Women's Health Network, and our other resources so that we can effectively share learning and collaboratively take action. 
This brings me on to thinking about Black History Month, as George has already mentioned, which is not just a time to reflect on the past, but an opportunity to address the present inequalities faced by Black communities. Too often we find this month can be reduced to symbolic gestures, but here in Sussex we really are committed to meaningful action. We recognise that health inequalities, particularly affecting our Black communities, are not only historical but persist today, and they're rooted in structural and social disparities, which we really need to be addressing. So how, as George said, do we move beyond this tokenism? Our approach must be more than just symbolic. It needs to be transformative. Cultural competence is a key part of this transformation. By embedding it into every aspect of at work through platforms like the Academy, we can break down barriers, improve trust, and ensure that all care pathways are inclusive and equitable for everyone. And they were actively reaching into the, those communities that are underserved and underrepresented. Black history can be our call to action, a reminder of the work that lies ahead and a commitment to making that a lasting change. I think the Academy can act as a driver for that change and plays a critical role in our journey. It can equip our workforce with the tools, knowledge and understanding they need to tackle health inequalities. Building on that foundation year, we need to continue to build trust with underserved communities in order to improve health outcomes for everyone in Sussex. The academies and fellows provide us with an opportunity to make an impact and drive change. And I'm personally very excited to see how we can build on all the brilliant work undertaken by the fellows and the academy last year. So I'm really looking forward to the rest of the web webinar and, and starting year two. Back to George. Thank you very much, Kerry. And I'm equally excited um, to be a part of the Academy this year and, and supporting our second cohort of fellows, uh, many of whom probably be joining us today. So we mentioned an interactive poll earlier and it's time for that now. Um, so you can see the Slido link in the chat. You can also use the QR code. So before we start this webinar, many of you will be familiar with this from last year. Um, we would like to get a sense of how you rate your, your knowledge and confidence on cultural competence in healthcare. And we're going to ask a similar question again at the end to see if there's been a shift of following all the talks that you've heard. So if you can all go on Slido, um, we'll start to see um, the results, hopefully, and your responses. We can see most people uh, expressing a reasonable amount. Seems to be quite a spread. If we're looking at the spectrum of, you know, this is the first time we're embarking on anything to do with cultural competence, or we might be gurus and really super well versed in the topic. But helpful for us to get a sense of where people are at. So we'll keep this up for a few seconds and uh, get as many responses as possible. So if you're on the call and you've got access to um, Slido, again, using the QR code or whatever device suits you best. Please help us by responding to this. We've got 38 majority are, are completing it. If we can get a few more responses in. Before we go on to our next speaker. 41, brilliant, We're getting a few more in. Seems to be a bit of a split between limited knowledge and a reasonable amount of knowledge. So hopefully today, uh, today's content uh, will be helpful in shifting that a bit. Brilliant. So we'll give it a few more seconds to get a few more responses in. And we can keep that in the background, but uh, now I guess it's time to introduce our next speaker. Um, a colleague of mine, uh, Lucy Hooper, 
uh, Research and Innovation Manager from Health Innovation, Kent, Surrey, Sussex. But Lucy, I don't want to steal your thunder. I'm going to pass the mic on to you to introduce yourself and your talk. Thanks, George. So good morning, everyone. Pleasure to be here. So I'm Lucy Hooper, Research and Innovation Manager from Health Innovation KSS. Um, I work in the translational research team, but also supporting George this year on the um, Sussex Health Equity Programme. Um, so I'll be talking to you this morning about the health equity principles that we developed and um, which we also presented uh, last year through the system wide training um, and also be providing a case study of some of the work we've done in terms of working with asylum seekers and migrants in the intercultural awareness training um, that was developed for that work. Um, next slide. So we're going to be going back over to Slido for a quick quiz. This is not to test knowledge, um, just for a bit of fun, really, and just to kind of, I suppose, see where people are at and to what degree you remember the 10 core principles for health equity. Um, so if you can make your way over to Slido and we could get the quiz up. Can see who's joining. That's great. We can go to the first question. So, what is one of the key factors contributing to health inequalities in Sussex? There is a thirty-second countdown on this, so you've got to be quite speedy with your responses. Don't overthink. Go with your gut. Is what I always say. Okay, just under 10 seconds to go. So the, yes, the answer was B, unequal distribution of healthcare services between rural and urban areas. So pretty good knowledge this morning, well done. If we can go over to question two, please, if we can open that up. And again, 30 second countdown, it's going to be quite speedy. So which population group in Sussex is most likely to experience greater health inequalities? Okay, just coming up to 10 seconds left. So we've got 10 more people to respond, six people to respond. Question two, Sharon. You can get the answer up. Oh, it's gone again. There we go. Yes, the answer was C, elderly people in deprived or rural areas. Again, very good responses. Good knowledge this morning. And if we can move across to question three, please, Sharon. So which strategy is emphasised in the communication principle for promoting health equity? So this really is testing your knowledge from last year, it might be a bit hazy by now. Um, so promoting self-management tools, developing and testing health literacy communication, identifying groups at risk of digital exclusion or supporting interprofessional education and training. Not so many responses on this, I think a bit of deliberation on this one. <clears throat> You can click through for the answer. It is developing and testing health literacy communication. OK, great. And if we can move over to question four, um, which of the following is a key focus of the policy principle in health equity? So again, testing your knowledge on the core principles. So embedding diversity and inclusion, supporting digital tools, measuring social value and social impact, or investing in climate sensitive health outcomes. We've got a few more responses on this one. And yes, the answer was A, embedding diversity and inclusion in decision making. I think there's one more question to go. What is the primary goal of integrating cultural competence into healthcare practice? Is it increasing the use of digital tools, addressing financial inequities, ensuring equitable access to healthcare for all populations, or reducing environmental health risks? Do 
just a few more seconds now. Hundred percent. That's a good way to finish, I'd say. Yeah, well done all. Thanks for participating. I hope that was oh right, we've got winners on this. Fantastic. I think they're a few joint winners. Rachel, Ali, Julia, congratulations. <laughs> Get a virtual cup. Okay, thanks all for participating. Okay, we'll now go back into my presentation. So some of you will have attended last year's um, system wide webinars um, and during those last year um, webinars we introduced the 10 core principles for health equity which were developed by our chief medical officer dr marianne Ferreau. And i won't go through these one by one but i think what's important to reiterate is that there is no silver bullet for promoting health equity it is a complex area where health and health inequities are driven by the social determinants of health, as well as systemic and historical factors. And these 10 core principles recognise this complexity and provide a framework to consider in what ways people may be disadvantaged and what action can be taken to address the barriers that people may face. So as part of this year's system wide webinar series, we'll be diving a bit deeper into each of the core principles um, and we'll be looking today at the principles of policy and comms, hence their reference in the quiz. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of policy, this considers the systemic barriers that may be getting in the way of promoting health equity. It asks us to ch uh, consider changes that can be made to mitigate these and encourages equality, diversity and inclusion to be considered in all policies. It also encourages us to align with other programmes that address health inequality, such as the Core 20 plus 5 approach for adults, as well as the children and young people. Um, so for this um, principle, you may want to consider which population groups are most disadvantaged um, by the system. Does what you're working on address systemic barriers to accessing health and care? And are, what, um, and are the people working on your initiative or project team diverse and inclusive to ensure that a range of pers perspectives are included throughout. Next slide, please. And comms is about ensuring language is culturally appropriate so that information reaches different audiences and that the messages are clear and understood. It also considers whether translation services, text to speech and braille, um, where they may need to be made available. So for this principle, you may want to um, reflect on what you seek to accomplish and how well this is communicated to a range of audiences with varying needs. How will stakeholders from different minority groups be empowered and engaged? And what provisions could be changed or added to ensure positive impacts on equity and inclusion? So next slide. <clears throat> So I'm now going to talk to you about a project which we're involved in, which um, involved developing intercultural awareness training for staff working with unaccompanied asylum seeking children. Next slide. So how did this come about? So in the KSS region, a multi-agency community of practice for those working with migrants and asylum seekers, which comprised uh, 90 delegates, were asked what would better help the mental health of migrants and unaccompanied asylum seeking children. What came out really strongly was that communication was a key barrier. Staff recognised that the children they work with are often traumatised, have mental health needs that are not being met. They come from a range of cultural backgrounds and respond in various ways to different communication methods. Therefore, a need for intercultural awareness training was identified. Um, next slide. So some funding um, was secured by Health Education England to develop the training, which was developed by Nas Fayette and co-produced with those with lived experience. The training was rolled out in a series of online and face-to-face -face workshops in the winter just this last year. Um, next slide. So the training was open to staff working across the whole of the KSS footprint and over 100 attended from a range of sectors, which really represents the range of organisations that come into contact with unaccompanied asylum seeking children, which you can see here. Um, the training was evaluated and has been proven to be effective and was extremely well received. We currently have a very large waiting list of over 100 staff who would like to undertake the training in the region, and we are exploring avenues for further funding to, to roll this out again. Next slide. 
So as the training was really effective um, and there was also a need, we consequently developed a toolkit together with NASFIRE and the ARC, which covers the intercultural principles and con concepts um, to provide some of the tools to apply in everyday work. The, the toolkit is focused on kind of therapists working with children, young people, um, but it can also be applied to your everyday work as well. So I'll talk through some of these concepts and I really encourage you to have a look at the toolkit to take away and apply some of the principles um, included within it. So the first one is around cultural competence. So this involves understanding one's own cultural identity and biases while learning about and respecting the cultural backgrounds of, of clients or those that you work with. The components include cultural knowledge, which relates to gaining factual information about dif different cultural practices and worldviews, cultural skill, which is the ability to effectively communicate and interact with people from different cultures, and cult cultural empathy, which is about understanding and appreciating the emotional experiences of individuals from different cultural backgrounds. So to develop skills and cultural competence, the toolkit provides actions you can take, which are around self-reflection, engaging in continuous learning, such as through educational workshops, reading and immersing yourself in other cultures, being open to learn from your mistakes and seeking feedback in a way that you engage with others, and working with mentors and others who can provide you with feedback on your cultural competencies. Next slide. So this one covers intersectionality, which involves understanding how various social identities, such as race, sex, religion, gender, etc., um, overlap and impact experiences of privilege and oppression. It acknowledges that individuals can face multiple intersecting forms of discrimination, and considering intersectionality helps workers avoid one-dimensional approaches that overlook the complexity of um, individuals' identities. So some practical tips include carrying out a holistic assessment that cover um, all aspects of an individual's identity, embedding inclusive practice that respects and acknowledges diverse identities, and adapting interve interventions to align with unique intersecting identities. Next slide, please. So micro incivilities are subtle everyday discriminations that can negatively impact people. These can include behaviours like interrupting or speaking over someone, mispronouncing names, using non-inclusive language and ignoring contributions altogether. It also includes making assumptions about people based on their cultural background. The impact of these can be quite profound in terms of eroding trust and rapport, making others feel alienated and reinforce feelings of marginalisation. Next slide, please. So the toolkit um, also provides the addressing framework, which is used to understand and respect clients' identities by considering various factors that influence their identity. So these include intersectional factors such as age, disability, religion, ethnicity, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, indigenous heritage, and um, nationality and gender. Um, next slide. So I've just provided here quite a high level overview of some of the concepts from that toolkit, um, given the time, but I really do encourage you to have a look through this and it, it's really, really insightful and will hopefully provide a lot of food for thought and reflection on your own communication approaches and some tools um, that will be provided to make you more culturally competent and aware. Um, and please do reach out for further information, put some questions in the chat and there's some references to the Tenkle principles and the toolkit included on this slide. Thank you so much, Lucy. What an incredible piece of work and a helpful reminder, of course, of the 10 core principles. And as you can see, uh, Lucy's details are on, on your screens as well as our colleagues, um, Becca Randall's, but um, for any initial contact or if you want to find out more about health equity and the work that we're doing and specifically the work on intercultural awareness um, with asylum seeking children, do feel free to contact Lucy. Um, very, very timely reminder. Thank you, Lucy. Um, so now time for our next speaker and 
um, actually met our next speaker a, a few weeks ago and was really moved by, by, by his story. And we're privileged to welcome Tony Collier, an ambassador and awareness speaker for Prostate Cancer UK. And don't want to steal Tony's thunder, uh, but was diagnosed with advanced prostate cancer um, some time ago in 2017 and since has become a powerful advocate for awareness uh, by sharing his personal journey and highlighting the importance of early detection, which he'll talk about shortly. Tony's also a marathon runner. I could barely do 5K. Um, <laughs> so uh, a better man than me when it comes to that. Uh, a trustee also of several charities and a dedicated volunteer. Tony, I don't want to steal your thunder. I'm going to pass the mic on to you and looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks, George, and uh, good morning, everybody. So I'm going to start off by telling my story. Um, I'm going to interweave um, into, into my story areas where I've experienced some healthcare inequalities and where healthcare inequalities and racial inequalities impact on prostate cancer care. Um, there is a PowerPoint presentation, but that's only about 10 minutes. So I'll just tell my story first. Um, so. Technically, my story really started when I was 45. I was sent for a medical by the firm I worked for, and it turned out that I was borderline clinically obese, and we know the problems with obesity in healthcare. And my blood pressure was so high that I'd be on drugs the rest of my life if I didn't do something about it naturally, which is what I did do. And I guess I should have understood the fact that I was getting a little bit round because my children called me Mr. Blobby, and for the younger ones, just, re just Google it. Um, and I hated the thought of being on drugs the rest of my life, um, which is ironic because I'm now on drugs the rest of my life to keep me alive as long as possible. I realised I needed to do something about it and the gym where I played some social squash had an informal running club and I decided to join them and see if I could keep up and thankfully I could. And about three years later we became a proper running club affiliated um, and our club secretary said now that we're a proper running club, we should all have a marathon on our CVs. So I absolutely categorically was never ever going to run a marathon, but she nagged and nagged and nagged. And eventually seven of us entered the Amsterdam Marathon in 2007. Um, I was 50 in that year, so first marathon at the age of 50. One by one, six of the others dropped down to the half marathon, leaving me, Billy No Mates, doing his first marathon on his own. And I completed that marathon um, it was reasonably enjoyable, strangely, but I swore never again, and then I swore never again another 18 times between the age of 50 and 59, as I did 19 marathons, including all six of the World Marathon Majors. Um, then I heard about this ridiculous race in South Africa called Comrades, which is an ultramarathon. It's 56 miles, 6,500 feet of climbing, um, and it's usually 30 degrees centigrade. And I decided it was something I really wanted to do. It became a big bucket list item. So I had a go in 2015, but I got injured a few weeks beforehand. So couldn't finish, but I did start. 2016, age 59, I went and completed it um, in just under 10 hours. It was a four and a half hour marathon, followed by another four and a half hour marathon, followed by the slowest 5K crawl through the streets of Durban that anybody had ever seen. Um, and then I was going back to do it again in 2017 because they give you a special medal if you do two successive years. And in the February 2017, I was 60 years of age. Um, I also started feeling a bit of a groin strain. Um, and this groin strain got progressively worse. Uh, got to April, I ran the Paris and Manchester Marathon a week apart as training runs for comrades. And then the groin pain was reaching the point of being unbearable. So I went to see a sports injuries doctor uh, Monday the 8th of May 2017. Um, we'd pre-arranged an MRI scan. He saw the scan and said, I'm not seeing what I expected to see. I think he was expected to see osteoarthritis in the, in the hips. Um, and while you're here, I'd like you to go and have a blood test and a chest x-ray. And tomorrow I've got you in for a full body CT scan. And as you can imagine, that evening, Monday the 8th of May, was terrifying because we had absolutely no idea what was going on, but it was clearly more serious than a groin strain. I got a telephone call from him on the Tuesday after the CT scan, um, 8 o'clock in the evening, and he said, I'm 99% certain you've got prostate cancer, and I'm calling to tell you because 
you need some more urgent diagnostic tests. Those tests um, were over the following 10 days, including biopsy, which in those days was done transrectally, so through the back passage, which was pretty grim, um, and bone scans and, and you name it. And then my wife and I went to see the urologist and he confirmed it was prostate cancer, but then he used the word incurable. Um, prostate cancer, once it's spread outside the prostate, is incurable. So there's the first takeaway from this session. Prostate cancer contained within the prostate is curable. Once it's spread outside the prostate, it isn't. So we need to catch it early. It's early diagnosis makes a difference. Now, clearly, um, that was devastating news. When you're told you've got cancer, it is devastating. When you're told it's incurable, it's indescribable. Um, I had a three-year-old grandson at the time, Ethan, who I dote on, still dote on, and I never thought I'd get to see him become a teenager. Well, now he's 11, and I think I've got a good chance that I've got three more grandchildren now. I feel blessed. Um, I also have a daughter, and I didn't think I'd ever get to walk her down the aisle, and I did. Um, it, she was the fourth generation of my wife's family to be married on the same date, the 30th of August, so um, it was an amazing experience. Now, the treatment for advanced stage prostate cancer is fairly horrendous. Um, what they do is they remove the male hormone, so it's chemical castration. And the impact on that, for me as a man and as an athlete, was complete emasculation. Um, fairly awful side effects. Um, and in particular, things like weight gain, loss of muscle mass, reduced bone density, hot flushes and hot sweats. So I became much more sympathetic with menopausal ladies than I ever had been before. Fatigue, which is a difficult one to explain, but it's like one minute your battery is completely full and the next it's completely empty and you simply can't function when the battery is empty. Then loss of libido and sexual function. So removal of male hormone means you don't get erections again and you lose libido. So you don't even think about sex. And then mental health impact. And this is where I experienced one of my first healthcare inequalities. Um, there is awful, awful provision for dealing with men's holistic needs when living with prostate cancer and advanced prostate cancer in particular. Um, my wife and I had private medical insurance back when I was diagnosed, which was very helpful. That in itself was another massive healthcare inequality because it meant I could access things that other men couldn't. So, for example, psychosexual therapy was incredibly helpful to my, my wife and I because it enabled, enabled us to realise that intimacy was just as important as sex. Um, but that's not available to men on the NHS generally. It's really hard to find. So there's another healthcare inequality. Uh, and so all the way through my prostate cancer journey now, uh, I've experienced lots and lots of different healthcare inequalities, which I'll talk about. Now, you can imagine the impact on my quality of life of this treatment, removing male hormone, was horrendous. As a runner, I, I went from being a sub elite athlete to a back of the pack plodder. Um, but I still run, I still try my best. Um, I, was then, I then found out that I'd had a right to this blood test, the PSA test, the prostate specific antigen, and I'd had a right to that from the age of 50. And one of the questions my wife asked the urologist at our first appointment was, how long do you think Tony has had this cancer developing? And he said, probably 10 years, which meant, of course, um, if I'd known 10 years earlier, I could have done something about it. I'd had no symptoms whatsoever until um, the groin strain started in the February before my diagnosis in the May. And the cancer had spread throughout my skeleton from pelvis to skull. Nearly every bone had a tumour in it. Uh, which was horrendous. So if I'd known about my right to a PSA blood test from the age of 50 and had one every year from 50 to 60, my cancer would have been caught early and could have been cured. Um, and I'd be experiencing a much better quality of life. For me, taking control of my cancer rather than being controlled by it was really important. So first question I asked my oncologist wasn't how long have I got to live? It was, will I still be able to run? And I'm very grateful that he said yes. Uh, so exercise has been a vital, vital part of um, my treatment pathway. And I would, and anybody who has patient contact to really encourage patients to exercise because it's vitally, vitally important. Um, another healthcare inequality is that I was 
scheduled to start chemotherapy, which back then was the standard treatment along with um, hormone deprivation therapy. Um, but I had private medical insurance and I heard about a new drug um, and I managed to access that drug because I had private medical insurance. That drug is still not available on the NHS as a first line treatment. So there's another healthcare inequality. Um, I was very fortunate to have private medical insurance and I've since tried to give a lot back by fundraising for cancer research charities because that drug that I'm being kept alive on um, is was developed here in the UK um, by uh, the Institute of Cancer Research and I'm incredibly grateful. Covid had a massive impact on um, research and also support for men living with prostate cancer. So fundraising is really important. And I've got a couple of asks of you. Um, if you think you can help raise money for Prostate Cancer UK to help fund vital research, that would be incredibly appreciated. Um, you can also probably see that I'm wearing my Man of Men badge. Um, if you could get one of those badges and wear it and tell, whenever someone that says to you, what's that badge all about? I've seen it on the television with the sports commentator, what's it all about? Tell them the, the story of Tony Collier, who was diagnosed terminal at age 60 and given a two year prognosis because he didn't know that he had a right to a PSA blood test from the age of 50. The other thing I would just say about asks of you is Prostate Cancer UK have recently announced their transform trial. We don't screen for prostate cancer in the UK and the reason we don't, I'll come on to, but the TRANSFORM trial is the biggest ever screening trial um, undertaken in the world. It's going to cost £42 million. Um, please encourage any men who get an invite to take part in the TRANSFORM trial to take up that opportunity because this is an opportunity that will help prolong lives and save lives in the future. I'm now going to share my screen and go on to the PowerPoint presentation. So I'm going to try to help you understand prostate cancer risk and your own risk and also talk about the ethnic risk and family history risk. You've heard my story, so I won't bang on about that anymore. Um, so what is a prostate? I think it's fair to say that when I was diagnosed, I knew I had a prostate. I couldn't tell, I couldn't tell you where it was. And I couldn't tell you what it did, um, but I do now and you will shortly. So this is the prostate. You can see it's this gland here. Um, it sits around the urethra and below the bladder. And of course, um, urine passes from the bladder through the urethra to the penis. So you'll hear a lot about P-orientated problems caused by prostate problems, um, not by prostate cancer though. Um, Typically, the tumours for prostate cancer fall on the outside of the gland, so that typically wouldn't put pressure on the bladder or the urethra. But if a tumour formed right next to the urethra here, you can imagine that starting to impinge upon the urethra and causing all sorts of problems with urine flow. Um, so what is the prostate? Typically, um, it, it's a small walnut sized shaped gland, as it says on the screen, and it basically makes semen. It carries sperm during ejaculation. And who has um, a prostate? Well, basically anybody born male. So always worth bearing in mind in terms of discrimination that trans women will still have a prostate and can still have prostate cancer. There are various conditions that affect the prostate. The first one is an enlarged prostate. So going back to the previous slide, you can imagine if the, this prostate here, if that was enlarged, that can get to the size of a grapefruit. So just imagine a grapefruit sitting here you just imagine the pressure that puts on the bladder and the urethra. Um, so an enlarged prostate is going to cause all sorts of uh, urinary problems. Prostatitis is an infection or inflammation of the prostate and that's cured by antibiotics. And the first test that you should have um, if you're suffering sort of urinary problems that might be an infection is a urine sample to test for infection. And then the worst case scenario is prostate cancer. And it's worth bearing in mind that the first two do not lead to the third. They are all three separate conditions. Now let's talk about risk. 
Um, one in eight men will get prostate cancer. So typically, if everybody on this call was male, statistics suggest that probably something like eight or nine people will get prostate cancer. 52,000 men are diagnosed every year, but regrettably of that 52,000, 10,000 are diagnosed too late like I was. And this is where we really need to pay attention. Early diagnosis through whatever means screening, preferably, we don't have a screening programme at the moment in the UK, but we want as few men diagnosed with late stage prostate cancer as possible because a late diagnosis like I had has been completely life changing. It's been life changing for my relationship with my wife, with my family. It's been life changing financially. And it's been life changing in terms of the side effects that I've had to deal with and still deal with every day. Um, most men diagnosed with prostate cancer can be successfully treated. Um, but it's worth bearing in mind that early stage prostate cancer often mainly has no symptoms. I had no symptoms and I had, van I had advanced stage prostate cancer. And I think back to when um, I was going through this process did I actually experience any symptoms? And I actually can't think of any um, until the groin strain started in the February. It's really, really important that you don't wait for symptoms before talking to your GP about your prostate cancer risk. Um, and this is where we also have another problem with healthcare because unfortunately, many GPs still believe that the PSA blood test uh, and, a, and a positive outcome from that leads to harm. Um, and that harm um, is preventing these GPs from actually allowing men to have a, a PSA blood test that they have a, a legal right to. And the reason we have the issue is because historically when men were diagnosed with low grade prostate cancer, those men were over treated, which might have meant removing the prostate um, causing harm because they then suffered incontinence or uh, impotence uh, and, and thankfully the diagnostic pathway has changed and the reason um, harms were caused were things like transrectal biopsies, we don't do transrectal biopsies anymore, we do transperineal biopsies which have much less risk and the diagnostic pathway has completely changed. We now have a situation where in the, in the old days, if you had a positive um, PSA blood test, um, you went straight to biopsy. Now, if you have a positive PSA blood test, you go directly to multiparametric MRI scan, which gives the doctors a much better idea of where the tumours may be. And then the transperineal biopsy reduces risk of sepsis and infection, and is also specifically targeted to the areas where they believe tumours may exist. Now, regrettably, many GPs haven't caught up and it causes a healthcare inequality because some men will go to their GPs and the GP will say, no, we don't do those because you've got no symptoms. But well, as you can see from the slide, early stage prostate cancer often has no symptoms and some GPs aren't aware of that. They aren't aware of the improved um, diagnostic pathway and they stick rigidly with this message that PSA testing causes more harm than good because 20 years ago that was the case. Nowadays, it's not. We've reduced harm massively uh, by using other things such as active surveillance. So men diagnosed with really low grade indolent cancer will not um, be given um, treatment. They will be actively surveilled. So, so active surveillance. Um, and th these are all really important parts of the change of the diagnostic pathway that makes such a difference. So if you meet resistance from your GP, please call the specialist nurses at Prostate Cancer UK and they will talk you through. But bear in mind, if I'd had a PSA blood test every year from 50 to 60, I would have been diagnosed early and probably cured. So who is at risk? So typically risk increases from age 50 and the risk increases as you, as you get older. But that is no reason to be um, not, not to consider risk for younger people. Uh, we do know of men in, diagnosed in their 40s and died in their 40s, so uh, please don't think of it as just an old man's disease. It can affect many younger people as well. This is where we, we meet um, ethnic differences. Black men are at twice the risk of white men. 
It's also worth mentioning that black men generally, when they um, are diagnosed with advanced stage prostate cancer, tend to fail as well. They also tend not to uh, engage in clinical trials to the same degree that white men do. So we have a massive ethnic difference here between the black community and the white community. And it's also worth bearing in mind the family history because um, the sons and grandsons of, of a man who's had prostate cancer are at 2.5 times greater risk because of their father's diagnosis. And there's also a risk if um, the mother or uh, sister has had breast or ovarian cancer. So please be aware of the family risk, but also please be aware of the, of the ethnic risk. Prostate Cancer UK on their website has a risk checker. It takes 30 seconds. We actively encourage people to go to the risk checker, complete it. Once you've completed it, it will tell you what your risk is. And basically it will say that if you're over 50, um, you're at greater risk. Um, go and talk to your GP about the PSA blood test. Um, it's worth mentioning that men over the age of 45 who, who have a family history and black men over 45 should be tested from 45 and not from 50. But the risk checker will tell you all that. And then the great thing about the risk checker is that you can have it, the results emailed to you and you can take a print out of that email to your GPs and say to your GP, I am making an informed decision about my wish to have a PSA blood test. So let's talk about the different tests. Um, the first test should always be the PSA blood test. PSA stands for prostate specific antigen. The prostate kicks this antigen out into the bloodstream. And as we get older, it kicks more of the antigen into the bloodstream. So typically your PSA levels rise as you get older. It's your right to have it. Um, and it's only a two minute test. It's not a very expensive test for the uh, NHS. Everybody's heard this myth about it's a finger up the bum and it puts lots of men off going to the GPs because they think they're going to be violated by a doctor's finger. Um, I would personally say just get over it because it's 30 seconds of discomfort that might save your life. But I do appreciate there are some cultural issues here where um, certain cultures um, feel very strongly about this. It's worth saying now that um, in many cases, the DRE shouldn't be used, digital rectal examination. Um, there is no need to use it and, and it should never be done uh, before a PSA blood test because it will raise the PSA. So nowadays, GP shouldn't do the um, digital rectal examination. But even if your GP wants to, don't be put off because, as I said, it's a 30 second test that might save your life. So why would you not do so? Now, I'd just like to talk about some myths. I think this is uh, one of the most important slides in this presentation. Keep hearing that prostate cancer is the good cancer to get. Well, I don't think it's a very good cancer to get. And neither do the other 9,999 men diagnosed too late every year. Um, my GP will invite me for a test if I'm at risk. Well, they won't. We don't screen for prostate cancer in the UK at the moment. You have to ask for the test and sometimes you will have to insist on the test. Now, it's really important that if you're patient facing, you are aware of all this because um, GPs need to uh, up the game in some cases because they're not aware of the improvements in the um, diagnostic pathway um, and they're not aware of the risks that men face. All men are at the same risk. Well, I've showed you already that black men are at twice the risk. And if you've got a family history, you're at two and a half times the risk. So we're not all equal as far as prostate cancer is concerned. And then I shouldn't bother my GP unless I've got symptoms. I had no symptoms for 10 years that the cancer was developing and I was diagnosed terminal and given a prognosis of two years. I'm very grateful I'm still here seven and a half years on, but I am very much an outlier. Most men on the drug that I'm on that's keeping me alive tend to get a year to two years from it before they have to go on to another treatment. So I feel incredibly blessed. Early stage prostate cancer often has no symptoms. The only way to diagnose prostate cancer early at the moment is to start with a PSA blood test, go on to a multi-parametric MRI scan, followed by a biopsy, 
and that's the, the process that we need to be following. Lots of support available. Uh, Prostate Cancer UK have lots of information on their uh, on the website. Lots of printed guides. They have a team of specialist nurses available on a free phone number. I mentioned the risk checker. For men who you come across who have been diagnosed with prostate cancer, please bear in mind that Tackle Prostate Cancer, of which I'm a trustee and vice chair, we have 130 UK wide support groups and we've recently received lottery funding to expand our offering into areas where there is greatest need, areas of deprivation uh, and areas where there is no cur coverage currently. So I'm ending my presentation with these, these words. Together we can save thousands of men's lives and ensure no men are left behind. Thank you for listening. Um, the message to take away is early diagnosis equals curative treatment. Late diagnosis means you're living the life that I'm living and it's not great. Thank you. Wow, 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 Tony. Thank you so much for, for sharing your powerful story and, and your experience most certainly reminds us all of the importance of early testing as per your closing remarks and alluding also to what Kerry shared at the start, reminding us of those left shifts, um, uh, the three shifts focusing actively on embracing prevention as opposed to, to sickness or just sickness and not waiting for symptoms. Talk to your GP, especially if you're over 40 or at high risk um, and encourage others to do the same exercise most certainly plays a critical role in prevention so let's do our best to stay active and encourage others to do the same and of course we can all raise awareness this is isn't just restricted or confined to prostate cancer awareness month which i believe is in march isn't it tony yep um and it's something we can be doing all year round uh, in our various capacities making every contact count um and as healthcare shifts more towards prevention, um, we each have a part to play in looking after our health and the health of those around us. So again, encouraged to uh, take action. And thank you again, Tony, for your courage and for inspiring us to take action. Um, thank you, George. I'm, I'm seeing the chat is blowing up and I know, Tony, you've got a number of things to, to deal with uh, uh, at your end. Um, and Thank you for sharing your details. I was going to ask if you're happy to do that. So yeah, yeah. do feel free to contact Tony. Tony, thank you so much. We're really Pleasure. grateful and we hope yeah. you have a good rest of the day and week. Back, back to Moving House. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, Tony. Wow, what, what a note for us to um, actually pause, reflect and take a break shortly. Um, we're hoping that all of you will, will stay online. Uh, we're hoping more will join. Uh, but again, food for thought for, for all of us um, across all, all, all the things that we've just heard from, from Tony, from Lucy and Kerry at the start. So hoping that this will galvanize us um, to take action, but also encourage us to stay on uh, after the break. So we're going to have a 10 minute break now and uh, we expect everybody to be back roughly at just before 10 past 11. So if you can get back around 11.09, that would be great. So see you all shortly. So next, it's a delight uh, and a privilege again to introduce to you our next speaker. We have Sylvia Stevenson, a transformative leader dedicated to helping organizations and most certainly individuals uh, to embrace diversity and um, create inclusive high performing environments. Sylvia's got lots of years of experience in leading cultural change um, and her work spans both global and local industries and um, again I don't want to steal Sylvia's thunder but she specializes in creating safe spaces and hopefully we feel and we believe this is a safe space for everyone for real conversations uh, guiding leaders individuals uh, to set diversity goals that align with their strategic objectives so today Sylvia will be helping us explore the importance of cultural awareness, cultural diligence and confidence. So please join me in welcoming Sylvia. Sylvia, over to you. 
Thank you so much, George, and hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the intro as well. And um, I just want to start out by saying I truly am sold out. I believe in uh, the diversity agenda. I, I just believe in it. If I was the only one in the whole world uh, that was going to champion the benefits of being culturally competent and driving inclusive values, then I'm happy to be the only one. I live and breathe by this. And so I don't know about you, but as I've been listening to uh, the, the previous speakers, especially um, with Lucy Hooper and really talking about the cultural competence and the Hicks framework and that powerful, powerful story um, from Tony Collier, I just asked myself the question um, that was asked earlier, what's going to really shift us and move us um, from where we are today to really beginning to accelerate uh, the inclusive value, values and to just reduce, if you like, the inequalities that we have in healthcare? And so I'm just going to close out with a reflective uh, session, if you like, where I want us to really think about our own selves, our own attitudes, our own ways of doing things and ask ourselves the questions. And I'm going to take you through cultural safety. I'm going to ask you some questions. We're going to talk a little bit, but I really want you to reflect. What is that one action that I am willing to take after this webinar closes? I love this saying that I hear a lot of the time. I refuse to be ignorant when knowledge is available. I love that. And the second one is uh, whatever we tolerate, we will never change. So we want to raise the, 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 the level of, of how we're going to progress and move forward. Well, I know that you had polls earlier, so um, we've got a poll. And I want to ask you this question. This is our first reflective question. Um, so you're going to need, we're going to go to Slido now. And I just want to ask you a few questions just to get a sense of what we are, um, um, where we are at, if you like, of this journey today. So earlier when we did the poll, it came out that people didn't feel as confident or had some limited experience when it came to cultural competence. So um, if you would just join. Um, hopefully people are joining the session and you're getting ready. Um, and I'm going to ask that you be really open and honest. Be honest with yourself. Be honest. This is an anonymous uh, survey. No one's going to come back um, to you. So you can absolutely uh, just be as honest as we can. So we can see that participants are joining. Um, and we're going to go to the first question because I'm just conscious of time. Ooh, oh, well, boy, people are up here. People are ahead of us. OK, OK. How comfortable are you when interacting with people from 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 cultures that are different from our own? Somewhat comfortable. And for those who have um, responded to that, there's only seven respondents. So maybe people are just coming back from their break. So if we can get to at least 30, let's get to at least 30 if we can. Uh, so there's 11 people. Yes. And for people that have said somewhat comfortable, just ask yourself, what does that mean? Um, what would get you to absolutely comfortable, to very comfortable? What would get you there? So just begin to think about that as we're looking. Let's see if we can get to 20, 25. I keep upping the numbers. Yes. So somewhat comfortable. So the reflection from that is to ask yourself, what do I think might get me from somewhat comfortable to very comfortable? OK, thank you. Um, next question. I'm just conscious of time. How often do you actively consider cultural differences when making decisions in your role? How often do we do that? Often, often. Um, and the people that have said often, what kinds of questions are you asking? What what are you using to enable those decisions? And how do you know that 
um, how you are considering cultural differences, how do you know the impact of that on the people that it might influence? So we often think about that, but if we look at health equities, it's probably not playing out in the way that we'd, we would expect. So what do we think is going on there in terms of 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 you know the cultural differences and it's great to see always so it'd be great to hear some of the best practices that's coming out okay thank you let's go to the next question i think we've got five how confident are you in your ability to respectfully there's the word navigate conversations about culture in the workplace now i specialize in this creating those safe spaces to have those really tough conversations somewhat comfortable uh, confident again i'm asking what would tip you over what would move you uh, to being very confident um, in being able to respectfully navigate conversations now one of the things that i i really love um, and believe is that every health professional every person that deals with patients or in the healthcare in this context needs to have confidence in being able to engage with different people it, it, it should be the absolute bare minimum it should be the, the 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 101 thing that is mandatory so somewhat confident that's really good and our next question what is your main area of focus for improving cultural com competency understanding unconscious bias and its impact. Unconscious bias has been around for so long. Um, um, what I realise in the UK that we don't necessarily have a really good framework that we could use. We know that um, in America uh, that there are some really good uh, frameworks, but in the UK we may not have um, as, as, as a really good framework to test this consistently across the board. Um, but yes, unconscious bias, its impact is a real key enabler for cultural competency. So thank you very much for that. Um, it just gives us a sense that actually we've got people on this session that are actually really keen and willing to uh, challenge themselves in moving forward. So I'm just going to share my screen now. And as I said before, it's about understanding cultural safety. And I'm going to be looking at the core principles of the health equity and just picking out a few of those um, areas. Um, cultural awareness, cultural diligence and cultural confidence, if you like, are the subtopics of cultural competence. And cultural safety is really important. So. I just want to give a quick definition of cultural safety. I know that we may all all, all know it, but cultural safety goes um, beyond awareness. So this is, I know what cultural safety is, but what exactly am I prepared to do about it? And it's about creating those environments where individuals, now listen to this, from all backgrounds, feel respected, feel valued and free from harm, especially psychological harm um, based on cultural identity. And we know that there are many uh, re research and reports out there that show the, the inequalities um, between different, different demographics when it comes to health equity. Um, and so that that's really important that we are beginning to understand that it is about dignity. It's about respect. It's about putting ourselves into the shoes of the other person and really wanting to make sure we offer the best care. Now, why does cultural safety matter? Well, two key things. It matters for a number of reasons. The first thing is, and if you listen to Tony's story, which was so powerful, it has an impact on well-being, especially the psychological well-being. Um, individuals from underrepresented, um, marginalised communities every day will experience some kind of discrimination, some kind of bias, some kind of microaggression. And it's not that... Uh, uh, the, the, the impact is not felt, but there's almost like a coping mechanism with it. But when we come to 
cultural safety, it's important to realize that we need to see the person for who they are. And so when I'm sat in front of a, doc of a doctor or a health professional and they're speaking to me about me, I want to feel that they care about me. So cultural safety has an impact on the mental and emotional well-being of individuals. And we know that employees in a culturally safe environment will actually have better outcomes and there'll be better health outcomes for patients as well. And then it also helps to mitigate bias and discrimination. So, you know, the top uh, learning outcome was about bias. Bias is, uh, training has been around for a number of years, but it's about mitigating it. It's interesting that we all have bias and if there's someone on this call today that says, well, I, I don't have any bias. And I think you need to be on Oprah because you're the only one in the world that would not have bias. So we all have bias. But are we all willing to have things in place to mitigate the bias? So that's the difference between shifting from head knowledge to heart, from theory to practice, that now that I know that I have this bias, how and what am I going to do about that to minimise the risk of this playing out when I actually um, am encountering um, people from different backgrounds and cultures? And this is how we start to embed cultural competence. So we're going to go into, I'm just going to um, look at cultural safety and I'm taking three elements of cultural competence, which is cultural awareness, um, cultural awareness is being aware of different cultures and not just being aware of different cultures, but being OK with what you are experiencing, being OK, respecting those different cultures. Cultural diligence was talking about data, talking about reporting, it's talking about policies and cultural confidence is really embracing and being culturally curious about what we don't know and being having the determination and the intention to thrive no matter what dynamic situation we might find ourselves in. And I want to just say quickly with cultural confidence, when we look at leadership across organisations today, typically as we go further up in the levels of organisations, it gets less culturally diverse. And I often hear um, leaders saying, oh, well, I'm, I'm white and um, I don't feel that I, you know, I'm qualified to push the diversity agenda. Well, there's a news flash. You're it. No one else is coming. I believe that all leaders, regardless of um, ethnicity, culture, background, needs to be culturally confident because that's the only way we're going to be able to shift and move forward in terms of embedding cultural competence as a core enabler, which will help with health equity. So we're going to look at communication strategies and, and, and look at how that can link to cultural awareness. We're going to look at policy making and how cultural due diligence is so important when making policies. And we're going to be looking at how we enable data for decision making. So in that poll, we saw a number of people that were saying yes. Um, you know, we often think about cultural um, competence in our decision making, great. What is the impact of that? So we have to go further other than just um, saying that we do it. So when we think about communication strategies and cultural awareness, so we know and we, we, we know that there is differences in the world and different cultures and different beliefs. It's about understanding that not everyone understands the health literacy. I mean, I've recently been working very closely with NHS organisations in the last two and a half years, and it has been a real learning journey to know all the jargons and the anacronyms. Now, just imagine um, speaking to someone where there might be a language barrier, lack of understanding, and, and just continuing with this same level of communication, um, um, 
and and actually assuming that the person will understand. Now, I've had a lot of feedback in some research that I've been doing this year that really talks about uh, the communities in particular, not really understanding health professionals, but, but check this out, not feeling confident to ask for clarification because the power imbalance is, is there's a power imbalance and they don't feel able to ask. So it's about adopting a culturally aware approach to health literacy. And we can, and the action from that really is to test the communication with the intended people for, for who we are creating it for, with the intended audience, rather than say, oh, this looks good um, and, and this is what, this sounds better. Why don't we test it with the people that we intend to use it for? Planning community engagement, so community um, strategies and driving that cultural awareness. I hear this very often that the, the, the black community in particular is really difficult to engage. I did a listening session in the community um, in May earlier of this year and was absolutely shocked to, to hear some of the stories of normal men and women in the community that just feel that they they, they don't trust health providers. They don't have a way to access proper health care. I was quite surprised even as a black woman. And so we looked at some of the, 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 res the solutions and one of them was about health care and health professionals need to come closer. Um, we need to be willing to engage with community leaders. Uh, we need to be able to feel comfortable with accessing them in their space. And one example that, that, that they shared, one solution and suggestion was, you know, why don't you come to some of our local uh, events? You know, you've got um, International Women's Day, you've got Black History Month, you've got all of these different cultural events. Why why not find out where there are going to be really good community events and start to build relationships from there? And it's when we start to listen to their stories, listen to the way they speak, listen to their beliefs and values. That's when we're really going to be able to get the intel, the insights that we need in order to create um, communication strategies that are truly inclusive. And the last one on this is addressing language barriers. So. I was smiling the other day, I was speaking to a friend who's a property director, property developer, sorry, and he was talking about going to one of his properties and the tenant there was a Polish woman and obviously there was a real language barrier. And it was interesting. Um, what they did was to use an app on the phone. She spoke it in her language in the phone, and then the phone was able to, to speak in English and it was it was vice versa. So a lot of the times, um, you know, the, where we see cultural awareness failing through communication is that we're not diligent enough, we're not determined enough to really make sure that there is two-way understanding. It's my opinion that a lot of the time, especially from the feedback, that I'm getting from the communities, it's like a one-way dialogue. It's a monologue. I'm being spoken at, spoken to, but actually I need more people to check my understanding. So think about one action or something that you might be able to do to really improve and up your game in driving cultural awareness through communication strategies. The second one is about cultural diligence and policy making. And I want to say from the get-go that um, I believe that policies should reflect the current status of the workplace today. Um, for too long, we see organisations um, who have policies that have been shaped for many, many years ago, um, and they are still sort of held, if you like, in stone, um, and, and they're not reflective. And one of the reasons why I think this is important is because there are shifts in society. We have demographic shifts in society. So two things that comes to mind. Today, we know that 19% of the UK population uh, are age 65 and over. So we are an ageing population. If you think about the population in London, today it stands at 37% culturally diverse. The London College, um, um, the Imperial College in London suggests that by 2030, that number will increase to 
percent. And what is what happens out in the community and in society will ultimately come into our workplaces. So it's important that we recognise that policies need to be reviewed to reflect the diverse needs of workforce and also the trends that will happen in our patient base. Another thing I want to say is this wonderful topic of menopause and the fact that a lot of NHS organisations, for example, are, are populated, the majority of employees are women, and, and a couple of research that I've done this year shows that um, these are Gen X, Generation X, uh, so women that are likely to be perimenopausal or menopausal. So what does that say for the policies? How do we deal with these different shifts in, in our demographics? And due diligence is making sure that we are consistent in best practice all the time. So the first point here is embedding inclusive values in decision making. So why don't you, if you said that you think about it often or every time, why don't you share in the chat some of the things that you do when you are making decisions and ensuring that they are inclusive Inclusive. And I think that means that we have to make sure that there is a diversity of thought, that there is somebody around that decision making table that's going to be able to say, have we thought about this? What is the impact? Can we check this out rather than go with the pressure of making a decision and moving to the next thing? The second thing, oh my goodness, I could do a whole webinar on this, digital tools and platforms. And so we know um, that AI is just changing the landscape of digital tools, large um, language models, machine learning tools. And I am really disappointed to see the widening gap when it comes to inequality. We've got gender bias in AI. We've also got ethnicity bias in AI. And I asked myself the question when I first started doing this research, like, how is this happening? And it literally is because we have people with bias, unconscious bias, that are training the system on biased data. You know, it's it's it, the machines don't train themselves. Somebody has to do that. And the algorithms that we're seeing today is further widening the inequality that we experience in the systemic elements of healthcare and also education. So it's important that even as we're looking at digital tools and and platforms and thinking of new ways to engage with people, that we do make sure that it is tested on the with diverse groups of people. One of the things to do is to make sure we build in enough time um, to make sure that we can get that engagement and so that we don't create new products and services, new policies, new ways of working that follow the trend and basically uh, continues to isolate and um, exclude uh, groups of people. And the last one here is really making sure that our policies are designed to address systemic barriers through health education. So on the 13th of October this month, as part of Black History, I hosted a conference in Berkshire uh, called Reclaiming Narrative on Health Education. It was amazing. We were supported by a number of organisations, including a Royal Berkshire NHS Foundation Trust. And what we found was that you know, we're only scratching the surface. There are some systemic areas that we need to address. And part of this a, a constant addressing is being able to continue the narrative. Um, I feel that um, at this stage of the diversity agenda, we should be further forward, but it's how do we do that? Well, you know, part of that is making sure that we integrate cultural due diligence in our policies, in our decisions, and then we'll begin to get insights into how we can start to address the systemic barriers. One idea is to really check policies to make sure that they reflect the workforce. And then the last area, cultural confidence, um, using data for decision making. It is my belief that data is a new currency for driving the diversity agenda. Without data, what are we doing? Um, and we are data rich in today's society. We have a lot of data, but how are we using that data? It was great that Lucy earlier talked about intersectionality, and it's my passion and dream to see 
organizations start to use data in a more informed way. So rather than looking at how many men do we have, how many women do we have, how many people with disabilities do we have, we should be able to be going into organizations and saying how many women from black African background are at perimenopause, potential perimenopausal age that will need reasonable adjustments. And we do that through diverse data profiling rather than just using data in a binary way. So it's really important that the data helps us to inform our decisions. So it's about one, having the confidence to question data and its sources. Um, I'm always known for saying that, you know, there's more to life than .gov and the census. And we are creatures of habit. We like to uh, go with what we know and always use our usual sources. But in today's fast moving society of AI and research papers, there's a lot more out there. So let's have the confidence to really question our data sources, our data systems, and make sure that they reflect uh, the growing needs of a diverse population today. One of the things that I know is a hindrance, and I'm speaking to a number of organizations about this, uh, is actually the tools, the systems, the healthcare systems that actually are not um, integrated. They don't have back-end integration. They don't have the updated fields to capture diversity data. So in a way, it's almost like the uh, evolution of data requirements is moving forward, but we don't have the systems in place to really capture that. So more investment is needed in systems. So having that confidence, not just going with the status quo, the second part is being bold. Now, you know, I always say that anyone that is passionate about diversity, equality, belonging, equity, all of those inclusive values needs to have boldness. It takes boldness to be the only one to raise your hand around the decision making table and say, I, I just want to ask a question, especially when the majority uh, have groupthink and the majority are in agreement. But we need boldness. We need you to be the one, you to be that positive disruptor to not just go with the status quo, especially when you suspect and know that a decision being made is not inclusive and will potentially exclude um, certain people. Um, in the community. So it's really important to have that boldness. And one way to do that is just to take a bold step once a week. I, I do that if there's something that I really want to break in, I'll say, right, today I'm going to do something really bold and I'm going to ask this question because it's been it's been bugging me or I'm really going to speak to this person about this really uh, difficult topic. So we have to turn up the dial on being bold and courageous in speaking out and holding our colleagues and ourselves accountable for making sure that we continue with cultural safety, cultural competence, all the inclusive values. And the last one is ensuring that there is equity through informed decision. Now, with this one, there's always the uh, the the conflict of finances versus uh, um, um, resources. So, you know, is is it worth? Are we going to get the the yield from what we invest in? But we really need to make sure that equity, it, which is different to equality, exists in our informed decision making, because we know that not everyone is at the same place. We know that, for example, people in rural areas um, are more likely to um, not be able to access health care. Uh, they, they might have poorer health outcomes versus people in urban areas. We need to be thinking about some of those discriminatory factors that are persisting, such as black women being four times more likely to die in childbirth than their white counterparts. We need to understand some of the real pain points and make sure that if we have to put more resources, more time into another area, we are confident to know that we're doing the right thing because it shores up the fact that we are being culturally confident using data for our decision making. And this comes under the umbrella of cultural safety. So in closing, I'm going to hand back to George. I just want you to just take a look at this uh, slide that you're seeing on the screen and just think about what is the one or two things that I am willing 
to take forward, that I'm not going to be like a, a, a human um, Wikipedia full of knowledge, but not really taking any actions. Um, I love this saying that it says um, one action is better than a thousand good intentions. So let's turn up the dial on really driving the diversity agenda. And this is just my closing remarks as I hand back to George. Creating cultural safety is about shifting the focus from the comfort of the majority to the empowerment of those who have been historically excluded and marginalised. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Sylvia. I mean, if there was ever a mic drop moment. Um, and what an insightful session. All the sessions have been insightful, actually, and particularly just now as you're speaking, what a reminder of just how how critical uh, cultural safety is, um, not only in mitigating bias and discrimination, but also in shaping the policies and communication strategies uh, that Lucy alluded to that impact well-being. Uh, in fact, that all our speakers have alluded to, from addressing language barriers to ensuring our digital tools and platforms are inclusive. Um, we've seen how adopting a culturally aware approach can truly transform the way we deliver care and engage with our communities. So um, as Sylvia has highlighted, it's about having the confidence to question the status quo, using data to drive equity uh, and embedding inclusive values in all the decisions that we make. And that's not easy. Um, the challenge ahead of us is to be bold to be intentional in creating environments where cultural awareness diligence and confidence become pretty much second nature um, but as well as being intentional acting on this and um, giving ourselves the permission to disrupt systemic barriers and uh, build a more equitable future for everyone so thank you so much sylvia once again thank you thank you and I'm seeing that the, the chat is, is is blown up again. And thank you for sharing your details as well, Sylvia. And I'm now going to pass the mic on back to Kerry for some uh, reflections on on what we've heard so far, but to lend an ICS, an integrated care system perspective, a Sussex wide uh, perspective um, before we go on to uh, our poll, our, our closing poll for, for today. So. Kerry, if I could hand the virtual mic back to you. Thank you, George. <clears throat> Excuse me. And thank you to all our inspirational speakers. Um, amazing to see the work going on um, that Lucy talked about and, and the inspiration that we could take from Tony and Sylvia. Um, today, we've really explored the vital intersection of health and equity cultural competence and community engagement. From understanding the unique needs of asylum seekers and migrants to addressing the stark disparities in prostate cancer and outcomes, so meaningly delivered through Tony's experience. And it was great to see in the chat the amount of people that were already texting family members um, and highlighting this. Um, so I think Tony's voice was, was loud and clear in, in prevention first. It's clear that our healthcare system must evolve with our diverse populations in mind. Sylvia really challenges us not to treat cultural safety as a checkbox. It's a commitment to creating environments where everybody feels seen, heard and respected. And it's a commitment we need to take on at a personal level, as well as in our teams and organisations being that disruptive influence that we've just heard about. I think as we reflect on the discussions today, there's a really clear theme coming through. Meaningful change starts with each of us. It's about how we interact with our colleagues, the decisions we make in our organisations, and, and how we really ensure that cultural diligence, awareness and confidence is embedded in our everyday practice and, and how we can take that forward. Sylvia and George both talked about making a commitment, and I've made one today. And I picked up on that consciously curious, culturally curious, and, and feel that that's something I can really take at every position of my work and challenge whether we've shown due cultural diligence, particularly through listening. So as we make those three left shifts that we talked about 
earlier and was highlighted in the DASA report, hospital to community, analog to digital and treatment to vent prevention, have we really been culturally curious enough? So as we leave here today, um, no doubt onto an extremely busy afternoon, probably jumping into the next meeting, let's not lose that. Let's think about each of us committing to one tangible step towards improving cultural competency within our sphere of influence. Whether it's engaging in that difficult conversation, whether it's challenging that bias or actively seeking out diverse voices in our decision making, every one of those actions counts and we can reflect on them. We've been given the tools highlighted in Lucy's presentation and some amazing insights from Tony and the opportunity to make a difference. So let's use them. In Sussex, we can build a health care system where we acknowledge diversity, but thrive on it, creating a future where health equity is not just an aspiration, but it's a reality for everyone. But I've really enjoyed the session, so I'll be reflecting on that throughout my day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kerry. Really appreciate that and, and those reflections. And please also commit to staying on for a few minutes because we're not quite done yet. We've got um, we've got an opportunity to do a pulse check via the poll that we did earlier, uh, just to gauge once again uh, the impact, I suppose, of of everything you've heard and how it's affected your knowledge and perhaps your confidence. Uh, certainly your confidence about the topic today. Uh, lots of weighty things, lots of powerful stories, lots of um, powerful insights as well. Um, and we just want to find out a bit more about that, but also get your general feedback. So the question again, now that you've heard all that you've heard in this webinar, how would you now rate your knowledge and confidence in cultural competence in healthcare? Oh. Um, okay. So whilst that's still um, going on, there's also a few follow on questions to this general follow on questions relating to your um, overall experience of this webinar. And as you know, and many of you, of course, would have registered for the series. This is the launch of the second series. So we've got a few more webinars, four in total between now and March, and would really encourage you to to let colleagues know, uh, because really the the intention and the action here is to make population health everyone's business and population health as an approach and its various components, health equity, which we've looked at in the first series and in a little bit more depth today and all the various components relating to that, which we'll be exploring over the next few months, including quality improvement, data, commissioning, amongst a multiplicity of other things. So we're really excited to be working with Sussex, be working with all of you across health and care, but even organisations that don't necessarily directly engage with health and care, but perhaps indirectly, voluntary care, um, third sector organisations, faith groups, all are welcome. This is an inclusive group and we hope to um, see more people over the next few months. I think we've had quite a few closing remarks and closing reflections and I, I want those to, I want to let those breathe actually. And um, given the time of year and given, you know, people certainly in the NHS or even, you know, in your personal lives, you were thinking of winter and the challenges and the fears and the real fears and the challenges that brings amongst just doing our day jobs. Um, I hope and I believe that we've all been galvanized today to uh, consider cultural competence, not as a buzzword, but uh, as a tool and as an opportunity for us to support those left shifts, but make a meaningful difference in our respective areas of work and life. And for this not to be restricted only to this webinar, but just how we do things and how we support the populations we serve across Sussex. So on that note, I wish you all a good rest of the day, a good rest of the week, and I look forward to seeing all of you and more of you, if you're watching the recording, in our future webinars. 
uh, a massive thank you to all our speakers. Um, thank you to Kerry. Thank you to Lucy, Tony and Sylvia and our team as well, Health Innovation Care CES, um, helping with this and of course NHS Sussex. So we look forward to seeing you all. Have a good rest of the week. You can have nine minutes of your time back. Um, take care.